Louisiana Eats is brought to you with support from Zatarans, maker of New Orleans pantry staples like Creole mustard, fish fry, and jambalaya mix since 1889. Recipes and more at zatarans.com. From our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans, this is Louisiana Eats. I'm Poppy Tooker. What's it like to make it big in the world of food TV? On this week's show, we've gathered together many of TV's greatest food celebrities for a glimpse behind the cameras. We begin by checking in with one of our favorite homegrown celebs, Isaac Toops. He and his wife, Amanda, have some big news to share about who's sharing the spotlight with him next. Then, we meet chef and television personality Carla Hall, formerly of The Chew, to discuss her fascinating career both on and off the screen. Finally, Cayenne Douglas of Queer Eye for the Straight Guys' first iteration joins us to share some special food memories. We're channel surfing to catch Food TV's next big wave on this week's Louisiana Eats. Hello, Isaac Toops, chef owner of Toops Meadery in beautiful Mid City, New Orleans. Hey, Amanda Toops. I am part owner of Toops Meadery in Mid City, New Orleans. If you're a chef and restaurateur, so much of your restaurant's success hinges on your ability to get people through your door. And one of the quickest ways to draw in diners is to break into the monster that is food TV. After several years of being featured on shows like Top Chef and Kitchen Takeover, Isaac Toops has a lot to say about that monster. He describes it as a creature from Greek mythology, but with a bit of a spaghetti western twist. The monster is Cerebrus, the three-headed guardian of hell. Because one head's great and one head's bad and one head's weird. And it takes all three of those demons to, 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 to get through it and to navigate it. It's, it's at first, it's very alluring. Like, oh, TV, wow, it's going to be so good. And the bad head goes, well, don't forget, you're going to have to do all this evil stuff. And then the third head goes, wait till all the crazy stuff happens. The good, the bad, and the weird. Isaac has experience with all three, but his offers from network producers have continued to pour in over the years. Both Isaac and Amanda have gotten better at taming the beast, forcing it to submit to their desires instead of the other way around. When the three of us spoke recently in their New Orleans home kitchen, we discussed Isaac's fast rise to fame and Amanda's first foray into TV. Gosh, Isaac, how many TV projects have you done now? Your your IMDb must be longer than your arm now, huh? Uh, full full disclosure, I haven't looked myself up. <laughs> if I have if I have one of those, it'd be pretty cool and a little disturbing. Uh, but you know, it all started. It started with a couple small projects, but you know. The big one, obviously, Top Chef was the big bad one. Um, and that is just, you throw yourself into the big, huge fire that is TV, not knowing. You know, I kind of didn't want to do it at first, really. I didn't want to be that type of chef. Kind of. Kind of. I practically booted him out the you, door. Yeah, you, you, said, you said, yeah, yeah, yeah do, it or, do it or don't, Isaac. Pick one of the two. I said you're going. Yeah, right. <laughs> and when you're doing it, it's nut job. Yeah. It's crazy because you don't know what's happening. You're sitting there with a bunch of professionals. And you know you're going to be with millions of views in these, these challenges or so, not something you train for, of course. No, no one trains for, oh, 20 minutes, here's some cuttlefish and an orange, make a frittata. Um, it's crazy and it's wild that you get off of it and then you have this time to stew where they're making it and you're just, just cringing. You're, you're bit over double, you know, having a drink of a whiskey with my coffee. Not that I've done that before. And then they air it. And then it, then it just starts to get crazier and crazier and crazier. And, you know, you're sitting there. I don't remember an episode that I filmed because I had to get drunk at my own bar. And then I'm surrounded by people. And then the fans come out. Oh, and they come out of the woodwork. And then your friends come out. I'm air quoting. Your friends come out. And the rest of your air quote family comes out. 
and everybody wants to start a little piece of the pie, which they think I've had this weird, humongous chunk of pie. Oh, right. <laughs> and I'm now, still a normal chef a trying to make bills. Oh, I'm a celebrity now. I get people at the grocery store, wow, you get your own groceries? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I, that literally happens. <laughs> so it's weird, and it's great. And it's great because, you know, we saw months where we had 110% growth from the year before, or after Top Chef airs, you're like, oh, this stuff works. And then what happens? Oh, Poppy, then what happens is then you start to like it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that, that, that can be a little weird, you know, because yeah. that gives you a bit of ego. And a little bit of ego is nice. Gives you confidence on TV. Gives you confidence on a radio program. Gives you confidence to go out like, man, let's make my own videos. Let's have my own show. Ha, ah, too much ego. You can't get your head out the door, and your wife needs to slap you in the back of the head and say, calm yourself down. That never happened to him. No, I just butter his ears to get him in the, in the door. <laughs> Good butter. Good high, French butter. High fat European butter. <laughs> so after Top Chef, your own projects came calling. Right. And so, you know, everything from well, Vice Munchies, Action Bronson, Today's Show, Food Network comes out. I'm recording some things right now. And there's, you know, there's a lot more courting. And there's a lot more unaired stuff than there is aired stuff a lot of times. Because a lot of times you'll, you'll do a pilot of something and the network or the producer will go, nah. And so you, a lot and of you the, just work for like months on you it. You work for yeah. months on it. So it can be a drag a lot of times. And even the popular stuff can be a drag. Even the stuff that comes out and go, hey, I really like that can, can be like, man, that was months of work. Sometimes it's money and time out of your own pocket and your family's pocket and then your family's time. And then you start to re- realize, hey, these these people should be paying for this and these people shouldn't be uh, dragging me out, out of my hole without money. Yeah. Because they will. And oh, they will. It's mm-hmm. unbelievable the way they will take mm-hmm. advantage of you Absolutely. if you allow them. Do you have an agent? Oh, now. We have a whole team now. Now we have a whole team. Yes. So when, mm-hmm. how did that come about? So for, I'm, I'm really always been kind of a background person and I thought I could handle Isaac's stuff on my own for a while. I was like, well, those, you know, I'll, I'll kind of act as the agent part of it. Um, and then, no, it's like, no, that's not, that's not my background. That's not what I do. So Isaac has two talent agents, um, with CAA in New York. And so one handles sort of like endorsements and one TV. Um, and then we have a full PR team and entertainment lawyer as well. So once we got a solidified team behind us, then things really started to make more sense. And there's less of that being taken advantage of because he's probably had, I mean, over the last, since Top Chef, I would say maybe 50 or 60 different production companies reached out to him and go, hey, you interested in filming? Hey, you interested in filming? And we were under, he was under talent hold for so long with Food Network that we had to say no. And so now we've been able to go back with, um, with the agent and go, who's legit? Like, I don't want to fool around with any of these, you know, little guys anymore who are going to ask me to pay for groceries and not be in communication with me for months at a time. We dated a few production companies. We really recorded each other. We, we Skyped and chit-chatted. And I think we've now settled on a, on a pretty solid one. So we're sort of trying to develop and see what feels right right now. Just like every project you've ever encountered, ever seen one of us at this table, you got to get burned first. Yeah. And then you learn your lesson. And then you get that team to go, like, oh, some a production company reaches out. And I go, no, 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 no. Straight to Hannah at CAA. Mm-hmm. And Hannah will go, no. Or maybe, or hold on, let me take this big, huge chunk of this contract out and tell them to go themselves. <laughs> I bleep myself out now. I'm so good You're at this so stuff. You're so good. <laughs> and they just flush all the stuff and they go like, hey, Isaac, this is worth it. Go do this. Now I understand that the beautiful, the inimitable Mrs. Toops is on a talent hold herself. For the first, it sounds weird. I, I, like, I almost want to have a panic attack thinking about it. I'm like... Get over it, honey. <laughs> when we talked on the phone, you said, well, I've done something I thought I'd never do. I, exactly and it didn't right. even register until I was like, wow, Amanda. So what's up with that? I'm insane. That's what it is. I've never wanted to be on television. It's never like been of interest to me. And people have asked Isaac and I f- to film together for years. Because people they like those couples TV shows. They People love like them. that. They love them. You and know? y'all are two wonderful, colorful characters. We- <laughs> We're pretty colorful. I mean, look at Chip and Joanna. Look at all the other people doing, even not, not even food-related stuff, home renovation stuff, drama on TV, Real Housewives stuff. People Ugh. love this stuff. It's for good reason. It makes good TV. I, we realize this. But, but people are weird. And Amanda said it perfectly. It's like when the children were younger, people get weird. Chase you, chase you down uh, the, the hallway at the airport asking you to sign something, and you have two screaming babies in your hands. Like, mm. read the room. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we had really strange encounters where when Top Chef was airing, I didn't realize how, 
I knew the show was popular. I didn't realize how popular it was. And so we were sitting in restaurants and people were filming us eat. We were like, what are you doing? Why are you being so weird right now? And you could come over and say hi. And we would, he would say hi, like whatever. That's strange. Yeah. So I also had a situation where someone posted a picture of what they thought was our home online. <gasps> and we have two small girls. And I was like, oh, hell no, no, no. It wasn't, but it looked like our house. It did look like our house. And they were trying to be positive, like, oh, look at Chef Isaac. He loves this. Look at the flag, the Mardi Gras flag or whatever. And I was like, are you insane? Like, you clearly don't have children. Like, what are you doing? So I really have avoided all of this for a long time. And we, we both, I think, had a little PTSD after Top Chef for a little while. He's far enough away from that now that people actually... It's some Top Chef, but a lot of it's YouTube videos that they know him for. But for me, they've asked almost every time if I would. And I was like, no, 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 no. But now my kids are old enough and they don't care that their dad is like well-known. Uh huh. They actually, you know, we had a little encounter in the parking. Like, oh, Chef, I, I love your YouTube videos and I love what you, love you on Top Chef. And my daughter's like, Dad, was that a friend or a fan? I'm like, uh, kind of both, baby. <laughs> and, and, and they shrug it off, you know. Uh. They don't want to watch me on TV. They want to watch uh, Princess Sophia the First uh, on TV. Uh, who cares, Dad? You're on TV. Am I going to be on TV? Not yet, babe. Okay. So do you know what potentially you might be having to do? Or It'll be food related. So uh-huh. I mean, that we know. and Because I don't think there's a lot of that out there. Yeah. You know, c- like married couples doing food and wine and that kind of stuff together. But we're still in the, uh, in the volleying back and forth with the tennis ball going like, what do you want to do? Well, what do people want? Oh, wow. Well, what is there out there? What network wants you? Oh, well, what are you willing to do? Well, I'm willing to get half naked. (laughs) Well, along with the fame, tell me about all of your auxiliary things that are part of what is becoming the Toops empire. You know, I have an iron in every fire. Every, everything, every little caveat, every little nook and cranny, we could do something to increase the brand, make a little money and, you know, the bigger your brand gets, the bigger your brand gets. So we have hot sauces coming out. I have a Louisiana liquid snake, my hot sauce. It's a bright using Louisiana cayennes. And I have my especially proud of smoky green, which is a smoked hot sauce, which you don't see a lot of. So it's made with smoked poblanos and smoked jalapeno peppers mixed with a lot of garlic. Of course, it comes with a lot of garlic. It's me, for the love of God. <laughs> so we've got hot sauces coming out and I've got a spice blend coming out. And I've got, I'm already working on the new book. Product endorsements and hopefully a TV show, fingers crossed, we'll probably land once sooner or later. Uh, and all that, you know, and then we're going seven days a week at Meadery. So literally every, this radio show right here. Oh. We opened every- up a shop online. You can purchase signed copies of the book and the hot sauces from tubesmeadery.com and we'll ship it to you. Thank you, Meadery Master Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's what a little cottage industry you all are, despite we're the just big tiny little. We're just tiny little people, but yeah. we're trying. We're just trying to uh, to do right. We, we, you you got to have the end game. Yeah. You know, got to have the end game. We, we got we got babies, and we want to retire in uh, this a smaller island. We don't need the big island. We just want a small <laughs> island, <laughs> please. I just want to be able to retire. <laughs> be able to retire, <laughs> like eventually, right here, yeah. right right here in Gentilly. Yeah, yeah we're would... fine with a small house in Gentilly. <laughs> Isaac and Amanda Toops of Toops Meadery in New Orleans, Mid-City. Coming up next, we meet chef and television personality Carla Hall to discuss her fascinating career both on and off the screen. Louisiana Eats returns after the break. Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Camellia Brand, Beans Done Right, a New Orleans tradition since 1923, and from Ralph's Redfish Grill, 
home of the award-winning barbecue oyster poor boy and nine varieties of fresh gulf fish caught and served daily. Lunch, dinner, and private events at 115 Bourbon Street in the French Quarter. Carla Hall is a chef and TV personality who was featured in two seasons of Top Chef before she became co-host of ABC's Emmy award-winning series, The Chew. Her guiding philosophy is to always cook with love. Combining her passion for food, people, and culture, Carla has written several cookbooks about comfort food. Her most recent publication, Carla Hall's Soul Food, traces the history of soul food from Africa and the Caribbean to the American South. I had the opportunity to speak with Carla during this year's Essence Festival, when our friends from the Jane Club in Los Angeles hosted a special gospel brunch complete with Carla's legendary biscuits. While the band played on in the adjacent room, Carla and I discussed her fascinating life and career both on and off the screen. Carla, I have so many things I'd love to know about you, but I'm really curious, how did your TV career start? Because all of a sudden one day, there you were, larger than life, and you've been there ever since. How did that begin? You know, interestingly enough, I wanted to do theater as a young kid, so at 12. So I did theater from 12 to 17, so it took me from 17 to 42 when I did Top Chef to probably get back on television. But what a lot of people don't know, five years before that, I did a, a little show called Food Fight on the Food Network, uh, one episode, and it was a competition. But I, I think because of the theater, I'm not afraid to be myself in front of a camera. So whenever I'm there, I, I'm myself. I don't pretend to be somebody else or, you know what I mean? So I, I've been very blessed and fortunate. Everybody I know has just loved you and your food on television, and what a great run you had with the Chew. So, your new book is about soul food, and I love your angle on soul food, your hashtag, what soul food means to me. What does soul food mean to you, Carla Hall? Um, soul food, to me, and... and and it's in the title of my book. Soul food are those dishes that are celebration dishes, like fried chicken and mac and cheese and, um, and greens and all of that, the, the food that I had at my granny's Sunday suppers. And it's also everyday food. So it is really more of a feeling. And, and, I, and I say in the book, what is the difference between soul food and southern food? And I simply say black cooks because it is the food that black cooks made for themselves. And to distinguish between southern food and soul food you know we came up with the title we uh, in the 60s soul food but the food itself started long time ago and I really think it's like the difference between a negro spiritual and a hymn you know the way I understand it you are approaching soul food from the place that your soul comes from and in order to do that, you've had to meet the ancestors. So who are your ancestors? I had my DNA done through African ancestry, and I found out that my ancestors are Yoruba from Nigeria and the Bubi people from Bioko Island. And there, there's also, um, and I forget the tribe, from Ghana. And hearing that, and I, I had, I was surprised how emotional that felt for me because as, as a black American, you, you kind of feel adopted because you don't know your ancestors. You can't go back but so many years. And to find out where my ancestors came from, you know, that was really emotional. But in the words of Dr. Jessica B. Harris, she will say, because a lot of people are like, oh, I want to go back to Africa. She said, yeah, but you can't jump over the quilt to get to the kenti cloth. And that means that you have to honor all of the patchwork in all of our family that was here in the States, but you can also honor the people who are in Africa. And it, and, and she's, such, she's so wise, and, and, I, and I think that um, I also have to honor, 
you know, the prices from Tennessee and the, the Glovers and, you know, all those other people. And this is the work that Michael Twitty also does by going back to these plantations. And, and that is a connection as well. So um, the plantations are my quilt and the Kinty cloth is, um, you know, that is those, that's my ancestry as well. And how does it turn out when it's on the plate? Like the personal terroir, exactly. Um, whenever I make cornbread, I think about the native indigenous because without uh, the native indigenous and the corn here, because I, you know Africans came over with, with cassava, so they they didn't have cassava here; they had corn. And so on my plate, I have cornbread, I have black eyed peas and and collard greens or mustards or turnip greens. And then there's sorghum grains and millet, and um, so all of those amazing vegetables. Well, there was something I read that just really tickled me because I understand that you weren't born an okra lover. Oh no, I hated okra. Oh my god, <laughs> I hated okra, and I have four in my new cookbook. I have four okra recipes, and as a chef, I can say why I don't like a thing. A lot of times, people can't articulate why they don't like a thing. And I didn't like okra because it was slimy and it was a texture thing for me. And so in my cookbook, it's either roasted, grilled, um, I don't have fried, um, or seared, you know, and, and so anything but boiled. I don't, <laughs> I can't do it. I can't think of another food that gives you that satiny mouthfeel that you get. Right. Um, I, I can't think of one either. And if, if you look at tomatoes, though, the tomato seeds, which have that, that almost satin or that gel around each seed, if you took all the seeds out and you concentrated it, you might get something like that, but not like okra. But I like okra now. I like it prepared a certain way, shall I say. Carla, I know people have nap time, people have play time, but I never met anybody who has biscuit time. Tell me about biscuit time. Yes. <laughs> so biscuit time started with my friend Chadwick Boyd, who did the biscuit festival in East Tennessee. And I thought I was going to go to that biscuit festival, festival because I love making biscuits and it was canceled and so he said well let's why don't we just get together and make biscuits because i was making biscuits with strangers in new york i i would meet somebody and we'd start talking like do you know how to make biscuits because i feel like people especially in the north need to know how to either make a good biscuit or recognize one because don't send me to a place that you say they make great biscuits and i get there and they are terrible so we started doing these classes with um, through William Sonoma because he has a uh, relationship with William Sonoma Chadwick Boyd, and we have like 300 people coming to our classes, and it's a free. I don't get paid for it. I will do a book signing, but it's really about the community of making biscuits, and everybody has a story or a relationship around bread making or whatever, and and it's. All of these different people, doesn't, it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter what part of the country you're from, it doesn't matter what your sexual orientation. When people come together to cook together, it is something that, that something magical that happens, you know, and it's such a level playing field. Carla, it's obvious to me that you know how to love people with food. Would you talk to me a little bit about how you do that? Mm. You know, I, I believe that, um, you know, if you're not in a good mood, the only thing you should make is a reservation. So when I cook for people, I know that whatever the thing is that I make, it goes into somebody's body. And I, I honor that. I truly honor cooking for people. And food is a way to share love. And that's how I nurture people. I don't have a child of my own. I do have a stepson, Noah. But um, I think food is the ultimate way to tell somebody that you care about them. And when you go to a restaurant, if the chef isn't in a good mood, you, you, anybody, if you're cooking for anybody, if, you, if you're not in a good mood, your food will be messed up. So what you need to do is to leave, get clear, and come back and to realize that it's an honor for somebody to take something that you made with your hands to put into their body to nourish them. 
Thank you so much for spending the time with me this morning. It was such a pleasure, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Well, Poppy, if you don't continue the conversation with me, I will come looking for you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much. That was chef, author, and television personality, Carla Hall. Whether it's a special holiday meal or an after-school grilled cheese, our favorite childhood dishes often evoke strong memories of those we love. Following the death of his beloved mom, Judy, television personality Cayenne Douglas enlisted my help to recreate one of the meals she served him as a child. Here's Cayenne in my kitchen in 2014 as we set out to stir up some taste memories. I love your, uh, your apron. Thank you. <laughs> hey guys, I'm Kyan Douglas. You may know me from the television show Queer Eye for the Straight Guy and the Rachel Ray Show. But today I'm here with my good friend Poppy and she's doing me a big favor. We're cooking up my mom's mac and cheese and pork chops. And it was one of my favorite meals that she made and Poppy is going to help me recreate it. So I'm super thankful and super excited. Okay, get right there. We're not... Oh, that's and I hear that. That's the sound you want to hear. Yeah, that's the sound that I remember. The reason I wanted to sit down with Poppy is because I lost my mom a year and a half ago, and I miss her. And she taught me a little bit about how to make the mac and cheese, but I never really learned how to do the pork chops. Salted side down. Okay. Salt is going to draw a little bit of the moisture out of the meat. Okay. And that. It's going to help build up what chefs refer to as the fawns. The fawns. Uh huh. From the time when she was a new wife trying to figure out how to cook for her husband to the time that she was a mother of two and, and wanted to make the holidays special, that, you know, the food that she cooked and the way she put a meal together was her way of expressing love. And I'm starting to smell that smell. You know, when you're a kid, you're all over the place. You're in this room, in that room, you're watching TV, you're playing games, you're outside, you're running all around. But when mom would start cooking, she never really had to call us to dinner because those smells would sort of waft out through the house or outside and all of a sudden, like that smell right there, that pork, that is such a good smell. But what I remember most was that period of time when I was a little boy and she was still sort of doing the Southern comfort food thing it's not like it's the best thing she ever cooked or was you know at the top of her game when she was making mac and cheese and and pork chops she went on to to do much more interesting and creative cooking but for me those were just the meals that I had when I was in school and I was growing up so the mac and cheese and pork chops is just sort of a standard Judy comfort food you know Wednesday night meal in the middle of the week and I and I and I loved it yeah, no, if you added water to your mom's pork chops at this point, you would end up with some gray, odd-looking meat. Well, you know where I'm getting the water bit is because my dad, and bless his heart, he said, well, she didn't put oil in there or anything. I, I think she just put water. And it just so brings back I memories. I can remember of just sitting in my mom and dad's dining room, this big wooden table. It was a, it was a pine wooden table that they had their entire marriage and just sitting there at that table and being with my family and the security and the love of 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 family it's amazing that all of those memories can just pop back into your mind you know just because of a crunch and a taste okay i remember that now and what we're going to be doing is a technique that is called deglazing and what you're going to be deglazing are those little brown built up pieces on the pan, which is where all of that delicious pork chop flavor is. is. 
You know, if my mother was here right now, I'm sure she would be saying, duh. She was funny. She, she was quick, exactly but she was kind. She was uh, always concerned that whoever was around was, was comfortable, that they had what they needed, that they were taken care of. And she was a saucy little character too. I mean, she liked to have a cocktail. Sometimes she swore a little bit, but she was just, she's just a good woman, a good, fun woman. Honestly, Poppy, it's such a real gift. So you put a little pressure with a spatula to get them on there, to get them yeah, seared. Yeah, I want to make sure that they're on that hot skillet and they're really getting as much of a brown surface as possible. And then, of course, we're going to need a clean plate to remove them too. So go in the cabinet okay. and grab me a clean plate. Other one. Okay, well, here comes the big test. Pour a little gravy on that. Pork chop's looking a little dry because we poured off the gravy. So can I just give it a go? Give it a go. Oh, my word. <laughs> Does it taste like home? It tastes exactly like my mother's pork chop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Poppy. Mmm. <laughs> I'm so tickled by wow. that. Wow, so good. Hmm. In the kitchen with television personality and grooming guru, Cayenne Douglas. What was that word, fond, I just used in the cooking segment with Cayenne? Stay tuned, and we'll explain that piece of scientific culinary magic when we come right back. Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from St. Tammany Parish Tourist Commission. Located 40 minutes from New Orleans French Quarter, the North Shore's Tammany Taste features the chefs and farmers, brewers and bakers of St. Tammany Parish's culinary scene. Visit LouisianaNorthShore.com to discover more. Louisiana's North Shore, where New Orleans has come to play and get away for more than a century. Additional support for Louisiana Eats comes from Cuba Travel New Orleans, a local travel agency now offering an authentic trip to the acclaimed Havana Jazz Festival in 2020, designed to support the Cuban people through music and arts. Visit CubanNewOrleans.com or call 504-252-9774 to book your trip today. This week's culinary quiz question, brought to you with support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen. What was that word fond I just used in the cooking segment with Cayenne? That's spelled F-O-N-D. It's a French word which directly translates as bottom or base. Fonds are the brown bits that stick to the bottom of your skillet when you're browning meats. The science behind it involves the way proteins react to heat when something crusty and brown forms while you're cooking. Chemists call this the Maillard reaction, when denatured proteins release an explosion of flavor that makes food delicious. One of my favorite Frank Brightston quotes is, brown is the color of flavor, 
which is his explanation for why Louisiana food has a leg up in taste on the rest of the world. Now that you know what those brown bits are, what do you do with them? That technique is called deglazing. The browned meat is removed from the pan and liquid, stock, wine, even water are added in and the cook must scrape those bits up off the bottom, whisking the liquid until your pan gravy is formed. That was exactly the technique that Cayenne Douglas's mother used to make his favorite pork chop gravy. I'm Poppy Tooker, and the fawns in your pan make for some great Louisiana eats. I'm David Rosengarten. I'm a food writer, wine writer, TV chef, cookbook author, most important, eater. In September of 1993, a new cable network hit the airwaves that changed America's relationship with food forever, the Food Network. After being tapped to co-host the nascent channel's first show, David Rosengarten quickly became its earliest personality. From 1994 to 2004, David appeared in around 2,500 Food Network shows, including his own hit cooking program, Taste. David shared with us the story of how he became the first Food Network star and offered us a glimpse into the channel long before it became the sensation it is today. You know, you have to remember that when we started the Food Network, and I did the first show, as I think you said, we had no idea that this was even going to survive, that it was going to be a success. People didn't even know if people were going to tune in and watch stuff about food on television. Of course, there were always a few successful TV shows like Julia Child and, you know, that kind of stuff. But that was PBS. That was different. That was PBS, and it was sort of random. You know, you might see one every once in a while. To have a food network where the programming was about food 24 hours a day, a lot of people thought this is never going to work. This is never going to happen. This is the TV Food Network. The TV Food Network is serving up something for everyone. We all felt like we were doing sort of like the the high school TV club or something like that. We started in very uh, way down there on the economic scale um, premises. You know, we were in like a lousy little place on way on the west side of Manhattan. And then it caught on pretty quickly and it grew pretty fast. And, you know, within a year, we were in a really nice studio and all of a sudden we all thought, Whoa, maybe people are going to actually watch this. On Food News and Views, award-winning journalist Donna Hanover and food and wine expert David Rosengarten update you on all the news that's fit to eat. And how did you come to be there at that time? Oh, I have such a weird showbiz kind of story. I had an agent who was sort of hammering me all the time to get talk to this guy, this Charlie Pinsky guy, who's a TV producer, because you could be good on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to bother this guy. Finally called him on a Sunday. He said to me, uh, well, sorry, I'm going to France tomorrow to shoot a TV show. I'll be gone for months. Uh, wait, where do you live? I told him, he said, you know what, I'm going to take a break. Uh, packing, I'll come by, comes to my apartment, we talk, I show him a tape of, of a pilot I did, he goes, hmm, you know, before I go to France tomorrow, he said, uh, I'm having a meeting with a guy named Reese Schoenfeld, do you know him? I said, no. He's starting this thing called the Food Network, do you know about that? No. Do you mind if I mention your name? I said, no, I don't mind. Day later, I get a call, are you the David Rosengarten who saw Charlie Pinsky last night? Yes. Would you drop your tape off by our studio? Yes. Next day. Would you meet at West 40, 57th Street? I did. And all of a sudden, I'm in a studio, and I'm talking to who, the woman who became my co-host, and for three minutes, we're talking about, uh, well, what did you have for lunch? I had a tuna salad sandwich, you know? And three <laughs> minutes later, this man comes out of the shadows and walks over, shakes Donna Hanover's hand, and says, well, we found our co-host. And I'm like, what? the hell is going on here and that he, he never came over to me he called my agent <laughs> and that was it then i had a job that's tonight's edition of food news and views i'm donna hanover and i'm david rosengarten be sure to join us each weekday evening right here on television food network
this man I just mentioned, Reese uh, Schoenfeld, he had started uh, CNN with Ted Turner. So his specialty was starting uh, networks, cable networks. But he was not a foodie. He didn't know much about food. And at CNN, they had a, um, a kind of centerpiece news program. He figured out it's the Food Network, I know, but we need a centerpiece news program, just like we did at CNN. So that was that first show, which was called Food News and Views. And Reese would come into our dressing room every night and say things like, I think we got our story. It's bovine growth hormone or, you know, whatever. It's the credit card wars in restaurants. And Don and I would look at each other like, nobody cares about this. So he was really trying to make a CNN-style impact, which did not work. Ironically, if you started a network today and it was all about that kind of, you know, parallel stuff about food... It would work. This it is the time. Work. He was ahead of his time. Now, tomorrow on Food News and Views, we will hear a commentary from Julia Child. And Florence Fabrican of the New York Times will deliver the best produce buy of the week. So then how do you make this transition from food news into then you begin to do the stand and stir? Right. At the time we started, the second show, the third show, the fourth show was all that various personalities who have now slipped into uh, the mists of history. Um, but I walked into Reese's office just a couple of weeks into it, and I said, hey, Reese, hey, Mr. Schoenfeld, um, I have an idea for a show. Yeah, what is it? Well, in every show, I would take one food or one dish, and I would just do 30 minutes on it. I would tell the history of it. I would discuss the aesthetics of it. I'd cook it. I'd sit down and eat it with the proper thing to drink and so on and so forth. Reese looks up at me and he goes, okay, when do you want to start? Now, today you have to go through like 64,000 people and committees before you get somewhere. Literally, the man said to me, okay, when do you want to start? And we started about a month later. I know you're out there to cook or not to cook oysters? That is the question. It must no. have been really exhilarating. It was exhilarating. It was exhilarating. The, technically, the hard part is, you know, people who don't do TV maybe don't realize this, but uh, I've just done three TV spots in New Orleans in the last two days. Um, TV's hard because it's the only job that you could ever go to. Maybe modeling would be something like that, but where you need to look like it's the best day of your life and you're totally fresh. So at the Food Network, in the weeks that we were shooting Taste, my cooking show, I would shoot 25 shows in five days, waking up at five in the morning, shoot all day, clear the studio for food news and views. Then I'd have to get my blow dry, come in as anchorman and look like, hey, it's David Rosengarten, it's food news and views, you know. Meanwhile, I've just done 25 cooking shows. I'm exhausted. But anyway, I'm not complaining. It was great. You must mm. have been a very young man at that <laughs> time to have that man. sort of stamina. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it sounds exhausting just to yeah, do it. Yeah, but exhilarating too. Because, you know, like when you're in a TV studio and the, there's a, it's usually cool in the studio, uh, temperature-wise, and uh, it's dark and then those lights go on and it's it's a rush, you know, it's adrenaline. And I didn't, I was so scared at first, I didn't realize that that would be the case. And now I'm never scared because I know my adrenaline is going to take over. But um, I was, somebody was co-hosting with me way back then, a guy from New York, who's known in New York, his name is Bill Boggs. He's done a lot of TV in New York. So he was brought in one night to substitute for Donna. And it was one of my first nights and we're in the dressing room and I go, Bill, I'm so scared. He said, what are you scared about? I said, oh, I, you know, I'm going on TV. And he went, man, what's your problem? It's just TV. And that's the professional's attitude. It's just TV. You know, for, for a normal person like myself, it was like, I'm going to screw up. I'm going to say something wrong. I'm going to look like an idiot. And Bill's like, even if that happens, it's just TV. <laughs> a mid-American treat. And with it, I'm going to drink a good mid-American beer. And I'm going to be halfway to heaven. This is food. Remember, life is a matter of taste. Bye-bye. When did you begin to realize, right. walking down the street in Manhattan, right. that perhaps your life had acquired a life of its own? Tell me how that went in the early days. Yeah, I mean... the. The interesting thing is that uh, this story is segmented into regions. Um, we had our strongest viewership in the early days in New Jersey, I think in Texas, and in Los Angeles, Southern California. So I'd be in 
Chicago or even San Francisco, nobody, you know, I was just John Q, nobody. Then I'd go to L.A., people would be, I'd be in a taxi and they'd be rolling down their windows going, love your show. You know, so when I went into those saturated markets, I could feel the difference right away. And later it spread to everywhere. So, you know, I mean, still to this day, and I probably did my last show at least, what, 13, 14 years ago, something like that. But um, to this day, I get stopped practically every day with people saying, I love your show, which is kind of cool. I would be remiss to end this conversation without asking you to please give me your state of food TV mm. today. Now, we're it's so huge. We're talking way beyond, of course, the one food network right. that, where it all began. But it, everything has gone in such bizarre directions in many ways to me it seems you you probably know poppy um i have a background in theater as well so um that's probably what helped me more than anything else when i walked into this virgin territory of food tv in 1994 i still apply the same standards that i always apply to any type of performance theater film food tv um i like people to be authentic and I find I'm a little concerned by the copycat stuff that's on TV, all the TV shows, um, beauty contests and reality shows. And, and you know, I mean, I, I understand it. It's, you know, not many people realize, but it's much cheaper to produce one of those than to write a script. <laughs> so there are all kinds of reasons for it. But I don't like it when people really are just playing the form I know that here's the moment where the guy presents the rose and it it just all seems so, you know, lifeless. Um, But oddly enough, when people have a a reality to them and a spark to them, not to say that they can't lose it, but I'm going to tell you somebody, for example, on the Food Network that I still enjoy watching, Guy Fieri. Like that guy, somebody might say, well, that's, you know, like dumbing down or whatever. However... When I watch him, I think he's into this. He enjoys this food. I like the kind of food he goes to. So you can do the format, the modern formats and stuff like that. Just be real. That's what I like. I hope we get back to more reality. I don't mean reality TV. (laughs) I mean reality, reality. (laughs) Well, this is such an amazing honor to have this chance to sit and chat with the great David Rosengarten. Thank you so much. Thank you. Food personality, author, and chef, David Rosengarten. That's it for this week's edition of Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Are you ready for some silly holiday fun mixed with delicious glamour and bottomless mimosas? Join me and some of New Orleans' most talented drag queens at Vessel Nola in Mid-City on Saturday, December 14th. Vessel's beautiful sunny space is perfect for a drag brunch, so put on your jingle bells and let's celebrate the holidays in style. Drag queen style, that is. For tickets, go to Eventbrite. You'll find the link on poppytooker.com, and while you're there, Catch up on previous editions of Louisiana Eats, find videos, recipes, and even order personalized cookbooks, too. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Zatarans, and from Camellia Brand Beans and the St. Tammany Tourist Commission. Additional support for Louisiana Eats is provided by the Palace Cafe, home of the weekend jazz brunch featuring a build-your-own Bloody Mary bar, located in the historic Whirline Music Building on Canal Street. Original theme music composed by David Pomerleau and performed by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. Big thanks to senior producer Joe Schreiner and special projects manager Reggie Morris, and to our business manager and social media maven Maddie Mulladew. Come visit us anytime in our Louisiana Eats studios at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. We're on Instagram and Facebook, too. 
Louisiana Eats is a production of Poppy Tooker Broadcasting. Mm-hmm.